Hi, I'm Jack Burgess. Uh, welcome back. This time I'm going to do something a little different. One of the comments on a previous YouTube video asked about maintenance of way cars. And right now I'm in the process of building all 11 maintenance of way cars that the Yosemite Valley Railroad owned in 1939. I have one left. And so I thought this might be a good time to show you what I've been doing, explain some techniques a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to go through the cars that I've already built and then spend a little bit more time on the one that I'm building right now, which is a crane, which has been a very, very challenging project. So a couple of comments first. One is to do this kind of projects, you really need photos. And I started collecting photos of the YV back in 1976. At that time, a lot of the, the rail fans of the 40s and 50s were still around and I was able to meet them. Sometimes I borrowed negatives that had never been printed. Uh, the condition was I print a set for the owner and, and keep a set. There was one person that I met, his name was Francis Guido, and he was the editor of this small publication. This is typical, uh, it's eight pages. Um, there were reports sent in by readers of what was going on. Uh, this particular one um, talked about the YV and that it was being torn up and they mentioned that certain things had happened and the turntables had been sold and so forth. Uh, so he was over in San Mateo, which is right across the bay from where I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so I went over to meet him and uh, explain what I was doing and collecting photos. And, and somehow I mentioned that maintenance of waste stuff and he said, oh, you really need to talk to Paul Darrell. Paul was a real fan that when everybody else was taking pictures of locomotives, mainly locomotives, primarily because the hobby at that time was collecting three-quarter view shots of steam locomotives. And uh, one person I knew went uh, to El Patel on the YV and took 10 pictures of the same engine because you didn't trade pictures, you traded negs. And so he got, was going to keep one neg and trade nine negs to other people for other photos. Well, this person, Paul Darrell, took pictures of maintenance away equipment. And I thought, I've got to meet this guy. And he lived uh, about an hour from where I live. So I wrote him a letter, pre-internet, and introduced myself, told him what I was doing. Never heard a word from him. And... Um, Eventually, his collection went to the California Railroad, or State, California State Railroad Museum, and I've got about uh, 20 photos that he had taken. I think one is a maintenance away car. So I don't know if Guido didn't understand what he was doing, or um, he was taking maintenance away car pictures of maintenance away equipment on other railroads. He certainly didn't do it on the YV. So I've got about 70 pictures of maintenance away equipment. Some of them I've got a lot of pictures. The crane I have a lot of pictures of because it was there um, toward the end or until the end. And um, it was always out where people could take pictures of it. I don't have enough pictures. We'll get into that later. But photos are necessary. What I do on every single thing I build, whether it's a building or it's a box car, a flat car, a maintenance away equipment, I draw plans for it first. Two reasons. One, I love drafting. When I was hired uh, 50 years ago, uh, that was one of the things I did, was drafted plans for street projects. So I still love drafting. The other reason I do it is for something that's more complex, say even a maintenance away car, I want to draw it up to scale first so that I can look at it and say, I think I have all the proportions right. I have, you know, if it has some extra windows, they are in the right spot. I don't want to build it and say, well, here's some plastic windows, I'll stick that, that's good enough. And then when I look at it, it doesn't meet my expectations. So every single car that I've built here, I've got plans and uh, we'll show you some of those. So the, uh, the first one I want to talk about is 01. It was a 36-foot tool car, was listed in the liquidation notice. I mentioned that before, 
when I was talking about research items, but on this particular case, all it lists is that it was a 36-foot long tool car, nothing else. But this photo does show the tool car back behind the side dump, but the most important thing is if you zoom really tight in, you can see the number 01. So that let me know that that car is 01. And uh, you can see that it has come some kind of a stack on the top. I had several other photos. This one is particularly good because it shows one whole side of the car and the end. And you can see there was a platform there. So it was a box car that they added a platform so that workers could climb up, go inside, and get the tools they needed when they were on a job site somewhere out on, on the railroad. I do have another photo that shows the other end of the car did not have a platform, which is logical. You're going to have everybody come in the same door, go out the same door, so forth. So from that, I drew up plans for the car, like I mentioned, and um, built it. Uh, at that time, I was already getting into 3D printing, and so one of the 3D prints that I had made was for boxcars. So I took that one, modified it by adding the end platform to one end of that frame, and uh, that was the basis for building it from there. So with that, all I had to do was add the sides, the roof, so forth, and uh, the final details. Maintenance Away 02 was one of their bunk cars, and fortunately I had this photo, which was a real good high-resolution photo. Uh, it showed a lot of details. It was Someone took a picture of the car. It was not in the background. A lot of cool details on this car, including all of the stuff that was stored on the truss rods under the car. Fortunately, I also had this photo, which shows the other side of the car. It doesn't show the whole car, but there's enough details around the doors and so forth that I was able to, to uh, do it. One thing that I struggled with trying to understand is what's going on in this particular picture or enlargement of the, the main photo that shows something on the roof that looks like it's collecting water maybe and that it would come down the funnel. I never did figure out what that was for. I modeled it but I still don't know what it was for. 03 was another bunk car. I got this particular photo way back in 1974 and I, you could see the bunk car at the back. This picture was taken in El Portel. Uh, this car was at El Portel in 1939 but I didn't know the number. Then I finally got this picture and if you zoom in real close and darken it, adjust it in Photoshop, you can barely make out the 03. I have a lot of other photos of the other side of it. A lot of guys were up there taking pictures at El Portel, partly because there was a very old steam engine that was out of service parked right behind it. And I must have 25 photos of that engine. It took me a long time to realize why I was getting so many pictures but it was a locomotive that had been built in the previous century. Um, and therefore, it's just like today, a lot of people are not going to take pictures of the newest diesels. Oh, here's a, an F3 or some ancient thing. Let's take pictures of that. Same thing. Now, this car was a bunk car. In 1939, it was there partly, I think, to house the, the train crews during the day. During the summer months, the passenger train would leave Merced at 5.30 in the morning, get here at 9 in the morning. The crew would then lay over all day and depart at 7 o'clock that night, not tie up until about 11 o'clock at night. So they only spent a few hours at home at night between the time they got to bed and they had to get up to get on duty at 5.30. So their whole day was basically up here at El Portel. So El Portel can get very hot in the summer, 100 degrees, and you are trying to sleep in a boxcar with a few windows. Uh, but that's what they did. They got paid well, but that's what the car was being used for at that time. It was originally uh, for maintenance away crews, 
But by 39, it was always here, and uh, I'm sure it was there for the daytime. Again, I had a lot of photos and was able to draw plans for it and then build the model. The next two cars are both flat cars, 04, 05. I have absolutely no photos of 04. Uh, I know it was a flat car, so I built it as a standard 36-foot flat car. If I get a photo someday and shows that it had something special on it, then I will either build a new model or modify it, whatever. I doubt that I'm going to get another photo. Right now, I've got 3,600 photos, and I'm getting a new photo maybe one a month, you know, a few a year. I have not gotten a new freight car photo for several years. So I took my best guess. And in order to say I built all of the maintenance away cars, I went ahead and built it as a regular old black car. Now, 05 is very cool because uh, I have two photos and they show the different sides. One of one side, the other picture is the other side. And they're straight on shots like Paul Darrell would have taken. And so this was, this was a fun model to build. It was very simple. Again, on this car, I used the 3D print of the flat car that I already had. That was the basis for the car. Added styrene sides and ends, a wood deck, and uh, detailed it, including the details like the cables that are hung along the side of the car. Next is 06. And this was a photo I got a long time ago for this car. It was obviously a flat car that had a box built on it. But what was it for? You see windows on one end of the car. You see something that looks like a, a part of the, the side lifts up. So maybe you could load something into there. But if you look closely through that opening, it looks like it's got junk in there. It is not boxes. It is trash. So what was it for? So here's another photo of the other side. Not as good of a photo. But... I thought about this for a long, I'm talking several years, trying to figure out what it was for. One detail on this photo, note that on this end, there is a awning over the end of the car and there's a door there. The car that it is coupled to is the cook car, cook and dining car. So I think this car was the living quarters for the cook and his assistants. They need to get up at four o'clock in the morning to have breakfast ready for the crew. You do not want them into a regular crew car and wake everybody up. So they lived on one end of the car, the other end of the car could have been storage for supplies or provisions or whatever that uh, didn't need to be refrigerated or whatever. So with the awning, they could go from this car into the dining car, get breakfast ready, have it ready for the crew by the time they were ready to eat. So this is what's really fun about prototype modeling is, and we have a chat list of YV modelers, um, and some of these things I will think about and then I will say, what do you guys think? Anybody have any extra ideas? But being able to share it with people is part of the fun and helps me think through even further. You know, am I missing anything? That kind of thing. But uh, we had a long ranging discussion uh, about these cars and uh, that just adds to the enjoyment. Next up is 07, which is the cook and dining car that we just talked about. It was built out of a baggage car, I, I assume, they added a platform on one end, which let the uh, workers climb into the car to have their meals. This was a 60-foot car, so I bought a baggage car just to get the roof. And since I've never bought plastic kits before for passenger cars, I didn't know what was out there. So as I recall, I got in touch with Andy Sprandio at uh, Model Railroader and asked him what I could buy that would give me a 60-foot passenger car roof and that's what I bought. So the challenge was to build a model which fit the roof. 
as opposed to building a, a car and then just putting a roof on it. And I know that I struggled with that to make sure that it fit, that the ends fit, and so forth. Otherwise, it was pretty straightforward, building the stuff that was underneath and so forth. 09 was a crane tinder car. This is the only photo that I have that shows even part of it. It's right here. Uh, you can read the number, so we know that's right. It was replaced by a steel car, 011, which was the very first of the maintenance way cars that I built. And I see a little bit of a sag. This is a wooden car. It's got water and, and uh, bunker C or fuel for the crane. And so that car, I think, was overloaded. And that's probably why they took it out of service. So I built it as it was out of service, obviously, because uh, the replacement was there in 1939. This was the 1938 photo, as I recall. I took the drawing that I had done for 011, made that as a template for where this was, and put that on the deck of the flat car and sprayed around it so that you would have this idea that it was a fresh deck and all the other stuff was weathered. I don't know if that's what it looked like, but it was my best guess, especially since I, I didn't really know. 011 is the replacement crane tender car. You can see that it has the same tank and so forth that came off of the previous car. Uh, I actually built this back in 1985. It was the very first maintenance away car that I built, primarily because I had quite a few photos and the liquidation notice gave me a lot of dimensions. Uh, I learned later that not only did it have this fish body side frames, but it had truss rods. I think this was a transition car that they were going from all truss rods to these side sills. And turns out the side sills were strong enough that the truss rods were not needed. So uh, it was a transition. I didn't put the truss rods in because I didn't know uh, they were actually there. But it was a fun car to build. There's a lot of details up here. I have a, quite a few photos showing what they had in there and so forth. So it was a fun car to build. I built it as a contest model. I've mentioned that before, that doing that pushed me to really try my best. Uh, and not to, not to beat people or to get a number, you know, first place, but to push myself to do better. So um, I don't remember what I got, it, probably a first, but I don't remember. Maintenance Way 010 is a side dump car. I talked about this car a little bit in the layout video. One major problem I had with this car is dimensions. I didn't have any dimensions for it. I think I had a couple basic ones. But what was really missing was the dimensions on these pedestals that are holding the body up. The tire body tips side to side. It's kind of like a, a, a end dump truck. I knew a guy that was a fan of the Sierra Railroad. The Sierra has some of these. They're, they're still up there. Uh, they have a different lifting mechanism. But he was able to send me his drawing a preliminary drawing which had the pedestals, just the basic thing, but it had the pedestals. So I drew that up in 3D and this is that drawing. So I did the pedestals, the frame and so forth and my thought was, was to 3D print this, build the, the frame or the box itself out of wood and match the two and I'd be on my way. So this was a um, an interesting project to draw up because I wasn't that deep into 3D printing at the time. But what I did is I, I drew one pedestal and I drew it out here. And then I knew where the other ones were going to be. So then I took this and I copied paste, kind of copy paste just like you do in Word or something. Copy pasted one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. here. And so you got to, you only draw it up once, and you put them where they belong. So I did that. I had it printed, and then I started adding the brake gear because it was going to be totally visible. And as you can see in this photo, I just got started on one brake pipe, 
it took me, as I recall, an entire day to put all the elbows and unions to get from w one point up and over the frame to start down the other side. And I realized that was not going to work. At that point, I, I thought about it and realized that the main air, airline pipe on a brake gear is has an out di outside diameter of one and an eighth inch. And that is the minimum size that can be 3D printed in the material I use by Shapeways. So that let me draw all of the brake gear. So I had that 3D printed, had all the brake gear on it, and my body would not fit the frame. 3D printing is very accurate in a small dimension, but errors accumulate over a larger dimension. So rather than build another box to fill the new frame, I drew this up. Now this had everything on it, all the brake gear, the frame, so forth, and printed that, and then I was ready to go. So all I had to do at that point was to add the mechanism on the end that tipped the body back and forth, and the wood platform across the ends, and the sill steps, and I was done. So here's the final product. You can see all the details there. So this is basically, except for the trucks, the couplers, these in platforms, and the sill steps, and these black uh, bars which tip the body, that is one 3D print. It worked out really well. I'm very happy with it. It looks like a prototype. Uh, it was a fun project. I learned a lot about 3D printing, and, um, and in fact, the fact that I could print all of the air brake parts let me then use those parts on the frames to build some boxcars that I still need to do. So those frames have all of the brake gear, the bolsters, everything ready. So the end of frame, except for truss rods, uh, is basically done. My current project is this building crane 08. I had absolutely no information on the crane as far as dimensions or anything. Uh, I did a lot of research. This is some of it. Um, I found plans for similar cars. I knew this was an American Hoist and Derrick crane. There is one on the Sierra Railroad. It's not quite the same. Some of the same ideas, but different. So I spent probably at least a year doing research and working on my drawing. I didn't do anything until I had my drawing completely done to the best of my abilities. One thing I did is, uh, if you don't have any dimensions, is this is, again, that same photo I showed earlier with the uh, crane tender car. All of the photos I have from this guy are really clear, good photos. He was a very good ph photographer, especially for the time. This is a, just about an absolute side view. But what do we know? We don't know anything about this car, except we know the diameter of the wheels. They're 33. And so what you can do is print this, measure the diameter of the wheel on your print with an HO ruler, and say, say it measures 24 inches. So it needs to be 33, so then you need to enlarge your picture by 33 divided by 24, and you would have an HO scale photo. That's kind of what I do, but I don't use prints and HO ruler. What I do is I take this particular tool, this is Photoshop, and say right here, we draw a box, we say, okay, that is approximately the diameter of the, the wheel. Down here under info, it will say this little box is 0.653 inches high. Then I will use that to measure the wheelbase and see what the wheelbase comes out to be. 
and that will I won't have to do a conversion there. I do, I use Excel, but then that comes out like five feet six inches. Usually it comes out six say five feet four inches. Well, that's it is really five feet six. It's not five feet four. So you have to make assumptions, you know, within the limitation of what you're doing. If you know that, you can get this. If you know that, you can get this. And from that, I drew up the entire crane in HO scale from the, the diameter. And it's probably not that accurate, but it's the best I could do. And when you get all done, I look at it and I say, is everything, does everything look right? Is something too big, too small, and make adjustments. Uh, this is some of the research that I did. Uh, I found um, a friend of mine, Eric Bracker, has uh, a company, and he makes uh, narrow gauge parts. Um, and so he had this little thing. This is a narrow gauge American Hoist and Derrick crane uh, that was on the Denver Rio Grande, I think, or one of those. I don't, I don't know my narrow gauge stuff. Um, I found other drawings. I had a friend that actually had plans for one. In fact, this is plans for that same Derek. It is, it's not even close to this, but it gives me more information. This is more information I've got. Uh, this is going to help when I have to rig it because I don't know the rigging on these things. This is the rigging to bring the uh, boom up and down. And you can see there's actually two pulleys here, and a pulley here, and a pulley there. There's four pulleys right there. So that was to be able to pull something up and um, take the load. So enormous amount of research. Um, so I got to the point where the plans were done. And so my first approach was to draw up as much as I could in 3D. So here is that effort. Uh, I've got the body all done. All of this was taken off my, my 2D drawing, but when I uploaded to Shapeways, they they had problems with it. It was a constant battle. I would I would draw this, I'd upload it. What they interpreted was not this. Things were missing. Things were cockeyed. I don't know. And I've never figured out what it is that some stuff I I sent it to them. It comes out exactly, exactly what I expect it to be. Other times I see errors, and I'll show you a couple in a few minutes. So I finally abandoned that idea and decided to build the, this portion from brass. So this was my approach after the 3D body did not work. This is brass. This is styrene at the very back. This is all brass. Uh, it was all soldered together. The... This is 3D printed, obviously. This is the gear that goes back here and engages a gear coming down, which will let the, the boom or the body turn. Here's the frame. Uh, I actually built the frame first because that was easier. Uh, this is all brass, brass channel on the sides. These are Archer rivet decals. These were 3D printed bolsters. What I did on this one is I really wanted things to be to scale. It's easy to overlook that when you're building regular cars, you're putting freight cars, you know, the old thing. I, I didn't make it to scale because someone's going to break it if they touch it type of thing. Um, no one's going to touch this. And so I made the grab irons out of 10 thousandths brass wire. Regular grab irons that you can commercially buy preformed are 20 thousandths. That's about two inches thick. Uh, so I was going to use eight thousandths because that would be closer to prototype thickness for the grab irons. But the smallest drill that I have is ten thousandths. Now, put it another way, the uh, regular drills, the smallest is a number 80. That's what we typically use for a lot of stuff. That's too big for regular grab irons uh, out of uh, 20, 000, or 12 thousandths. So these are even smaller. So this will sit on here like this. Get the gear back up. And 
It's not going to pivot. It's going to be glued steady when I put it together. Then this right here is the will go right here and that's the weights that you see. This is the contour you see on in the photos and so forth that what the side of it looks like. The roof is 3D printed. Came out what I wanted except that I don't know how I did this but there's a 15,000 gap between the roof and here. I could fill that in with some 15,000 styrene but I had some other problems things that I wasn't happy with and so I took my my drawing for this and added some pipes that come out of here there was a headlight at the back there's two headlights on the front this little part which I printed separately which is three little bitty gears there, one of them broke off it was so small but that was supposed to fit right in here and this is the issue that this might might be in scale at some places but things may not fit and so you can see that right there that that's going to fit but what I did on my drawing to redo this is I took this which I now know is going to print okay and put it in there so that's done so that print I'm still waiting for so while I was working on the frame and the body I kept thinking about how am I going to build this boom I had enough photos that I was able to draw this all up but you can see that it's got steel on here this is all steel of course bracing going back and forth there's pulleys there's supports there's this is a, a little two little steam engines right here that they had a crane oper not a crane but a um, a bucket operation where they can use it like a, a um, tractor and my first thought was make this out of brass because you can get the brass thin enough to replicate the prototype but the complexity of it was such that I didn't think I was going to be able to do that so I decided to do that in 3D so here's the two sides and the bottom and you can see I put rivets all along here um, at this point there were about 400 rivets um, the bottom was solid and so forth and this was working out really well until I uploaded it and found some problems so here we are in Shapeways here's this part that I've drawn up that I just showed you has been uploaded and um, it looks good you can see all the rivets and so forth uh, now I've, an option at this point is to go into tools and open in 3D tools which lets me look at it closer and this is what I saw see that little line right there we'll zoom in that tells me I've got a problem there that they do not see that floor as solid very very subtle but I should not see all of that those lines and so forth so I did not know what the problem was uh, but I knew what at the, my approach at this point had a major flaw and no matter what I do it was not going to get corrected so coming back to here what I did is you can take this item right here say copy and paste and make a second one so what that let me do is I took one of these and I took the whole floor off I erased it the other one I erased it erased everything except the floor so and I have two parts I uploaded the floor into Shapeways and it was good. I uploaded the sides and they were good. So then I went ahead and continued adding stuff to the sides, left the floor because the floor is all done. And I don't know, two weeks later as I was 
getting more and more complexity. I put the two get back together again, and they were good. A week or two later, I had more stuff on it, and I uploaded and I had a problem again. So I took the floor off of that one, put it back on, and it was good. So I don't know what's going on at Shapeways, but that's what you have to do sometimes. So from here, um, we'll go to the final. Okay, so here is the boom completely done. I've uploaded it and it's being printed right now as this is all going on. I've added gears here. This section right here is, and if we look down on it, there are two cylinders here, steam cylinders. And this is, these two parts are turning a crank and you can see the crank right here. There's little gears right here that are driving these guys, which will run this other thing up and back. So, I don't know where I found this. I found this on the internet somewhere, but that is basically, is not this one, but it's the same concept. So this, and I knew these dimensions from my drawing, so I was able to draw all this stuff up. Same thing on the pulleys, same thing on the gears. I drew one gear, and I uploaded it, made sure that Shape Aves was fine with it, and they were. Then I, I had a center line out here. I put those, took them just like I was talking about on those pedestals. Put one gear here, one gear here, and then this, this was actually very hard to draw two gears and have a mesh. And of course, in the final product, you don't see it. You, you can't even see these teeth. We're, we're talking a gear that's about that, that big. 16th of an inch in diameter. At this point, there's about 750 rivets on the thing. I also did these pulleys, uploaded them, made sure they were good, so forth. So when I had everything done, I uploaded that file to Shapeways, and the next day I get the email that I always hate to get from Shapeways. Help us resolve issues with your model so-and-so. I used to get these every time I've uploaded stuff, and I've, I've gotten wiser and learned more, but I did not expect this one. And so they're rejecting it because of thin wires, and they'll give you a view of what they're talking about. So here's this portion I was just talking about. There's the two steam cylinders, there's the rods, and they're saying these parts are too thin to print. I know they are not because they are tapered. This end is a small end and it is exactly one and an eighth inch in diameter and they can print that. This is not that thin because it's getting bigger. It's an inch and a half up here. So the reason, I think the reason they caught it is because they could not accurately measure it because it's a taper. I know that it's right. One of the choices that you can do this at this point is click on a little box that says print it anyway, which I did. You have to agree, I think, three times in a row to make sure you haven't been drinking or something because this is an expensive part. You know, this was about $40 or so. And you don't want to print something that's $40 and then you get it and these are gone because they were too thin to print. But I was, I was so confident that I know more than they do about this that I went ahead and did it. As I mentioned, it's still being printed right now, so we'll see next week if, if it was worth the gamble or not. The interior, I had some gears and so forth that I thought about using, but they're going to be back in here and you're not going to see stuff very well. But I still have to put all that stuff in there. And so I started thinking about, well, I can, do, I can draw the gears up and have them 3D printed. It finally dawned on me, why don't I draw the floor, because I need to put a floor in here anyway. This is too low. So this will slide in there. It has the seat, the controls, the drums, the little steam engines that turn all this stuff. This support sits under the roof right here. This, see these two, these two things line up? That's what supports all the, the forces on these pulleys up there. 
So this will work out slick. I've already printed up the water and uh, fuel tanks. This is the steam boiler. Uh, I've got the, the device where you can see the, the water level, so forth. Um, so that'll sit in the back. It, it's not going to be very visible, but I know it's there. So at this point, I'm waiting for some more prints to come from Shapeways. Hopefully I'll have them next week. And at that point, I will finally be able to start assembling stuff. You know, I, this can't go on here until something else happens and all that kind of stuff. So if everything prints okay, uh, the rest of it should go fairly fast. Then painting, weathering, lettering, and um, it'll be done. So um, once that's done, uh, maybe I can have a time to, to share the final product with you. Hope you enjoyed the program. Maybe you could think about taking on a project that's a little more challenging than what you've had in the past. You would certainly enjoy it. See you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.